Uh, my name is Paloma. My name is Paloma Coltenango, and I am the volunteer coordinator here at San Diego 350. My pronouns are she, her, ella, and I am very, very happy to see you here. Um, uh, before you know, we get started, please, if you can go ahead and add your pronouns to your name. If you don't know how to do that, um, you can go ahead and click the three dots up by your name and you'll see the rename option and you can go ahead and rename yourself there. We also ask that you please stay muted um, for the duration of the event. We also have, um, if you have any questions, comments, please go ahead and add them to the chat as they arise. Um, we have a answer and question period throughout the session. Um, we will be recording the event, as you can see from the notification you got. Um, and again, if you have any issues with sound, you can't see the slides or something is happening, you can also go ahead and private message Augusta, our intern. Um, and Augusta, if you want to raise your hand or just wave to folks um, so that they can see you. You can also find her in the chat through the name. Um, she can go ahead and help you out with any tech issues that you have. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. So if we can go to the next slide, Peter, thank you. Um, before we get started, let's do a land acknowledgement. Um, for those of us who are here in San Diego County, we are zooming in from Kumeyaay land. I want to thank the ancestors that came before us who cultivated and took care of this land that we now occupy. It is important for us to pay our respects to the past, to the present, and the future generations of Kumeyaay people who continue to live and work in our area. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening for our latest webinar, Forecasting Transportation in San Diego. Peter, if you can take me to the next slide. Thank you. Um, if you do not know about San Diego 350, we are an organization that is volunteer led, we're multi generational, and we're trying to build a movement to prevent the worst impacts of climate change and climate injustice. We do this through education, we do this through outreach, through public policy, we do this through mobilizing people, um, whether that be mentorship, coming out to the rallies, etc. Our members strive to create a future that support a livable planet and a just society. I encourage you, if you don't know or are just curious to learning more, um, to message me. I can meet with you. You can email me at paloma at sandiego350.org. We'll also go ahead and add that to the chat. I'd be more than happy to connect with you and um, tell you a little bit more and what our current volunteer opportunities are. Also, you can sign up for our newsletter and know about future events. And I'm going to go ahead and um, this time we're, we've had past webinars that describe the importance of reducing vehicle miles traveled in order to meet our regional climate goals. We've highlighted specifics like SANDAG and MTS initiatives, and we've raised awareness about the urgency of the climate crisis and how we can address it. This time we are focusing on microtransit a relatively new strategy to address the transit gap um, and one in which especially which is especially suited to serve the environment justice communities at this point i will be turning it over to tonight's moderator steve galeb who is our san diego 350 transportation committee co-chair steve take it away oh you are muted Thank you, Paloma, for getting me to unmute and for doing such a beautiful job of setting the tone for tonight's webinar. Um, I want to, uh, and I want to thank everyone for being with us and just introduce our expert panel. Um, alphabetically, the first panel member is Jill Galvez, council member of city of Chula Vista. We have Sanjeev Nanda, transportation consultant, also the lead author of our white paper on microtransit. We're delighted to have Rani Narula Woods, who's the founder and service operation superintendent of LA Metro Micro, and Jennifer Williamson, who is a senior planning manager for the San Diego Association of Governments that we in this county call SANDAG. So in just a moment, we'll hear from them um, but first, I want to just briefly explain something about what microtransit is. And I should mention that 
three or four months ago, I had no idea what it is. And I imagine that there may be some of you for which it's a new idea as well. So microtransit refers to shared rides in vans or shuttles that are running on either fixed or on-demand routes and schedules. It's especially suited for serving neighborhoods that are underserved or not served at all by public transit. We at San Diego 350 see it as an adjunct to conventional transit, not a replacement. If implemented wisely, microtransit can increase transit ridership by filling gaps for residents who don't live close to bus and train stops. Microtransit is now being rolled out in towns and cities across the country. Both Sacramento and Austin, Texas, have long running microtransit service serving multiple zones within their regions. It seems to be an idea whose time has come. And microtransit uh, was one of the five big moves that was described in the regional transportation plan by SANDAG under the category of flexible fleets. Our team has in, at San Diego 350 has re recently written a white paper on microtransit led by Sanjeev Nanda, who is a panelist tonight as well as a member. And in the paper, we say, we argue that microtransit can address some of the difficult problems in our region related to climate and transportation. One is inequities in access to transportation. Another is gaps that are not covered by bus and rail services. There's also traffic congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. And then the problem of not enough affordable housing near transit. So we hope to see local and regional governments introduce microtransit projects in the future where it's needed most. Our region already has a number of microtransit pilots that are running and more that are being planned. So here we see a picture of the Carlsbad connector taking people to the coaster, the Chula Vista senior shuttle, which Jill will be talking about, and at the bottom left is the national city Frank, or Frank, I'm not sure how you say it. So um, now it's time for us to hear from our panelists who are going to each briefly explain to us what their work is about and their work in microtransit. So first I'm going to ask Jill Galvez from Chula Vista to in introduce yourself and tell us about the microtransit project that you spearheaded. So thank you please. very much. Well, thank you very much, Steve. And thank you everyone for, for uh, attending this session tonight. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'll show, if you look on the bottom of your bottom right hand of your um, screen, you'll see uh, the map of the Chula Vista Community Shuttle, which is a three-year pilot of six electric shuttle vehicles, um, uh, one ADA van included in that, that operate Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. as a result of two $1 million grants, $1 million from the CMO Clean Mobility Options Grant and $1 million from um, very generous benefactors um, at the CCDC here in Chula Vista. And uh, our shuttle operates in, in the service area and picks anyone up door to door and takes them wherever they'd like to go door to door for free, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., as long as they're 55 or older. And they can bring a companion with them. They can call um, the service by using a, an app called Ride Circuit on their smartphone. Uh, or by making a telephone call, or they can even flag down a driver. Um, uh, I, I will tell you, uh, when we um, launched the project, I've been working on this for about three, almost four years now, I guess four years ago, probably this month, I was touring Fred and, and seeing everything that they did in downtown San Diego. And, and thought how wonderful it would be to have a service like that in Chula Vista. Because as you can see in the map on your screen, um, it's a very dense area, it's about three square miles. And within that area, uh, you have we have two fixed rail trolley stops, the H Street um, and E Street Blue Line trolley stop. We have City Hall, we have our Civic Center Library, 
downtown Chula Vista Historic Third Avenue. We have multiple senior centers, um, Frederica Manor, the uh, Congregational Tower, um, but also senior serving mobile home parks, Canterbury Court. I think we have probably about eight to 10 senior centers um, on this in this area. We have a veterans um, a serving hospital. We have um, Scripps Hospital. We have multiple grocery stores and um, doctor's offices, uh, dental offices. It's really a condensed um, area shopping mall. Chula, the Chula Vista Mall is right in the middle of this um, map. And when we started, uh, uh, we, we were crossing our fingers and trying to teach seniors how to download the app and call the service and, you know, explaining how this went. We didn't have a very big promotional budget. Uh, we, we kicked off June of 20, uh, June 13th, I believe it was of, of this year. And the first month of service, we had less than 250 riders. And last month uh, we had uh, close to 1,250 riders. So over a thousand person difference. And the word is just spreading um, that the, the vehicles are very, very clean, um, air conditioned, uh, quiet. The drivers are um, super courteous. And, and we'll talk later in this, this discussion about how great of a need this is. But I can tell you that this has been probably the best thing I've ever been involved with in my entire life in terms of um, doing a project that really, really makes um, a difference in people's lives and, and changes uh, changes things for the better for an entire community. So um, I'm very proud and um, looking forward to, to, to um, hearing from my counterparts and also answering some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, and next up, um, we have Sanjeev, uh, who doesn't have his own project, but is going to tell us about his work in microtransit. Sanjeev, please go ahead and let us know um, your background in microtransit. Uh, thanks, Steve, uh, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be on this panel, and I, I, I think I need to uh, tell tell you a little bit about my journey to this place because, um, kind of uh, unusual way that I came to my microtransit and you know caused the white paper and the project at uh, San Diego 350. So it's been a uh, had a long career in technology R and D, um, 30 years uh, at Bell Labs and at Qualcomm uh, until 2018. And then in 2019, I found myself uh, at Sandag as a strategic advisor on technology and data as Sandag was starting the work on or continuing work on the 2021 regional plan. And so at Sandag, it was a fun time for me. I was um, you know, able to bring my technology experience and knowledge and kind of love of quantitative and data skills and so on uh, to the 2021 uh, RTP, um, working with these uh, kind of totally new experiences, working with planning professionals at Sandag. I got a crash course in uh, transportation, land use and whatnot. Um, and I, on, in, in turn, I gave Sandag planners a sort of a better handle on the technology roadmap. For example, um, with my background, I was able to, uh, you know, demystify the real world timeline for fully autonomous vehicles versus the industry hype uh, that's been going on. I was also able to investigate another exciting uh, technology called dynamic wireless charging for heavy duty electric vehicles, um, you know, dynamic electric charging charging for uh, battery of battery electric vehicles uh, trucks and buses so that's another topic for another day so um but most exciting uh, at sandag was for me to learn how uh, sandag's data and modeling efforts go into the regional transportation plan i got to see how the data informs uh, the policy the regulations you know the investments that we make and so on and so uh, i found that we have really reliable demographic data, we have you know, employment data, we have data on trips and commutes and non-work trips, um, and also on v VMT and greenhouse gas emissions and so on. But there's also challenges uh, with, with, with planning because you have to project you know, to the future, <laughs> for example, the you know limitations of predicting how uh, people would adopt something, a new uh, mode of transportation like microtransit, and so I uh, looked at all this. I saw that microtransit has 
seemed to me had great potential and realized that you know to quantify the costs and benefits we need to project from the pilots that are um, you know going on around the country as well as from academic studies and simulations so it kind of appealed to my you know research bent from the past and so, um, so I think that we have to kind of figure out how to, uh, I realize you have to figure out how to work with the uncertainties and unknowns um, uh, as we project for the future. So then um, my contract with Sandag ended this March, uh, earlier in the year, and I kind of got connected to the San Diego 350 transportation team, which is, uh, which was kind of just the perfect thing because uh, I found that basically San Diego 350 transportation team is a kind of a research team and you know there were team members are specialists in all kinds of topics and they basically set high standards they dig deeply they read they have time to read and and think about uh, problems and question assumptions and so on and uh, I found that people had expertise in battery electric buses and you know I learned about green versus blue hydrogen I'd never heard that those terms before I learned about BMT and land use and so on uh, as from and from experts and so these people uh, you know they've been working in climate advocacy and transportation planning and uh, understand the inequities that have resulted from you know the choices we made in the past and so I pitched uh, I came and pitched microtransit to the team and you know just as they would they basically um, as something that uh, you know would address inequities and provide access and also call, provide, do VMT reduction uh, starting now, you know, not years in the future. And so then we started a microtransit study group and that resulted in the uh, in the white paper uh, that we published in August. And in the white paper, we've included this call to action. Um, you know, we, 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 we understand that it has a Microtransit has a potential for great impact for to address access inequity, reduce congestion and emissions, reduce transportation costs for people who need it most. And we would like Sandag, MTS, and NCTD to roll out pilots and work with local communities so that there's good potential for adoption. And then we'd like to see uh, the agency develop a comprehensive plan to integrate, fund, and operate microtransit um, uh, in 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 these communities throughout our region, so that's sort of the journey that uh, brought us to this panel discussion. So that's thank you, thank you, Sanjeev. And uh, next we have Rani Narula Woods, who founded and now supervises the largest micro transit initiative in the nation. Rani, please introduce yourself and tell us about your work at LA Metro Micro. Hi, I'm Ronnie. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you. Uh, Jill and Sanjeev and team and Steve, I'm really excited to learn more from you. Uh, I think what might be helpful is a bit of background in terms of Metro Micro. So about five and a half years ago, we started looking at sort of the changes in the industry from LA Metro. And we were starting to see that companies like Uber and Lyft and others were starting to make major strides in this space. And so what we wanted to really understand was what is this new technology? What benefits might it bring to the public sector? And how could we possibly integrate it in the way that we deliver our products? And so over the past five years, we've gone through a number of different journeys and learned more about what the technology itself offers, but also what is intended in terms of the customer experience and really work to align that with our environmental and equity goals in terms of uh, where we stand as an agency. For uh, Metro Micro, <laughs> we've been operating for a relatively short period. Uh, we are going to complete two years of revenue service operations this December. Uh, as Steve mentioned, we are the largest program in the country. We run eight zones across LA County. For reference, LA County, as you know, is one of 58. Uh, we pre-pandemic had a population of about 10 million, so 10 of 40. And essentially what we were focused on was understanding how a new mode could fit into our family of services. And so we really wanted to, again, focus in on testing the technology, testing the use cases, and ultimately trying to build a business case and an operational model that could potentially be sustainable at LA Metro. 
uh, we started out in the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, really looking at what type of procurement tools would work. How would we contract this? What would we do uh, from a public sector standpoint? What would we look to the private sector for in respect to how quickly they can move? And sometimes, frankly, uh, how slowly we might move. And so that was something that we kept in mind. And so we went through a pretty thorough design process before we launched the service. Uh, currently, we are on track to provide about a million rides by the end of January uh, 2023. So we're pretty happy about that. We've got about one more year under the pilot. Uh, we have a workforce, which includes three represented unions, including our frontline team, uh, who largely came from Amazon, Uber, and Lyft. And altogether, we have about 200 people on the team. And we're just continuing to build it out and kind of use this as a laboratory, hopefully, for the industry. So as you can see, uh, these are the service zones. They've continued to expand, probably from the map you're even looking at as I try to focus in on it. Uh, the service itself is $1, as mentioned here. And in respect to our annual budget, we run about $40 million. So glad to answer any questions and look forward to learning from the group. Thank you, Thank you. so much, Ronnie. And, uh, and now we have Jennifer Williamson, who is such an excellent communicator of all things related to Sandex initiatives and so many different initiatives. So uh, Jennifer, would you please tell us about what you're working on related to microtransit with Sandag? Absolutely, thank you, Steve. So, you know, it was mentioned early on that Sandag, you'd like to convince Sandag to go ahead and include micromobility as an option. And the good news is that Sandag already is. And if you look at our 2021 regional plan that we adopted last year, there's quite an extensive move um, at Sandeg to include micromobility. We actually call it flexible fleets because we don't think it's just one type of service that we identify as micromobility. Um, it, it's kind of ident identified throughout the region for different use cases. So Sandeg has identified three different use cases for um, microtransit and those include first and last mile service, so that would be access to transit essentially. And then the second option that we're looking at is point to point services that help to supplement transit where there might not be that many transit choices. And then finally, replacing transit altogether with micro mobility in places that it just doesn't make sense to operate really big services. So this past year, Sandeg spent a lot of time developing the, the flexible fleet strategic plan. And I'll go ahead and post that in the chat when we're done here. And basically what the flexible fleet strategic plan is, is it took a deep dive in the San Diego region to determine what type of use cases made the most sense for different types of areas. Additionally, we also identified tier one and tier two project areas where we think that microtransit could be most effective. So the goal there is to identify three pilots. We have federal funding um, to identify three different pilot areas to kind of kick off, hopefully in this fiscal year, but probably it'll bleed into next fiscal year a little bit. Um, towards that end, Sandeg's also been a leader in the San Diego region on developing a bench. We call it a bench. It's essentially a pre-cleared group of microtransit providers that we can then use to go out and um, contract with to provide these different services. And the good news is that San Diego structured this bench so that our local jurisdictions and our member agencies can also participate and take advantage of the bench so they can expand out their services. San Diego was very much involved in the Carlsbad connector and um, also in the FRED service. So we have history there and we're very much um, looking forward to getting our pilots underway. And we've developed a flexible fleet task force in the region that's gonna help us identify which pilots should move forward in a responsive manner. And just one last thing that you might've all heard about in the media recently, Sandex undertaken what we call our um, request for innovative concepts. And this is kind of what we talked about before about you know some level microtransit as innovation. Well, one of the concepts that is moving forward is called Beep, and essentially Beep has a 
very strong microtransit component where they're looking at not only utilizing microtransit to provide access for folks first and last mile as well as point to point, but also using electric vehicle and creating electric, um, you know, electric charging infrastructure to support the use of those services. So we're super excited at Sandag, and we have a lot going on to um, encourage and advance microtransit throughout this region. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you all the panelists for introducing yourselves and telling us about your work. So now we have a question for all the panelists. And the, the question is that in San Diego and elsewhere, many low-income households and seniors lack access to buses, the trolley, and trains. How can microtransit address these inequities? And are there examples from the project you're associated with that would explain that? And I'll begin with Jill on this question. Thank you. Oh, I'm so happy to answer this, Steve. Thank you. So, um, so, so see, we started our project with seniors because one of our two grants came from a senior serving organization. And, you know, in this economy right now with uh, cost of gas um, escalating as it has, with the cost of energy escalating as it has, food prices, rent has gone up. Um, a lot of our seniors, we have a very senior um, intense community here in Chula Vista, especially in Northwest Chula Vista, um, $100 or $200 a month um, that someone might have to pay for transportation can be completely saved um, by, by utilizing the service. And um, the more our seniors have started to, to utilize the service, um, ho hopefully the more they'll feel comfortable letting go of, of their vehicles or um, they'll save money by not having to call Uber or Lyft. Uh, but the need has been great. Um, many of our disabled veterans um, are now able to take micro mobility to the Blue Line trolley, um, to take um, the, the trolley to the UCSD Veterans Center, uh, Medical Center. Um, you know, uh, grandmothers who used to depend on um, their grandchildren to take them shopping for shoes or underwear or just to pick up prescriptions uh, or get a blood draw, um, they can do all that independently. And um, and, and I, I just have to tell you that this is this has been life trans, uh, life changing and transformative for so many people. Um, it's given people freedom. Um, from um, the financial burden of transportation, um, the confusion of uh, public transportation, uh, the, the, the same drivers, we have six drivers driving at any one given time in, in, in the service area, and they have their regulars, and so that familiarity um, is, is very beneficial, and um, I can just tell you that, that without this service, um, I, I, I think that we would be where we were before, which is, you know, folks living in isolation, um, you know, uh, barely making ends meet, um, and, you know, perhaps more collisions on the road. Uh, in my particular district, uh, we're starting to lose all of our parking spaces as the state has taken away parking requirements for new developments. Um, the city of Chula Vista has sold a few of our downtown parking lots to, um, pay for previous redevelopment um, decisions in the past. And uh, we, you know, you're more than twice as likely, or you were more than more than twice as likely to be hit by a vehicle in Northwest Chula Vista than any other part of the city. And many of those accidents occurred with people, you know, who were um, a little bit more advanced in, in the years. And so I, I just can't um, emphasize enough how important this project has been. Um, and how how much we must absolutely follow this through um, and, and expand it um, to not only uh, Southwest and, and the other parts of Chula Vista, but also in the region. Um, I've been asked now by people up and down the fixed rail um, uh, between the five and 805, um, folks from San Ysidro and Imperial Beach, National City, uh, you know, it's Barrio Logan, they, they'd all like the service to be expanded to their areas. It's, it, there's a great need for it. Thank you so much, Jill. And Rodney, the same question to you. And I noticed, that I think that uh, LA Metro Micro began with some of the lowest income neighborhoods when it first began, like Watts and Compton. And so could you uh, talk to us about how it deals with inequity? Yeah, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate you highlighting that, and that's a great question. 
uh, for Metro Micro, it was kind of really kind of an interesting space at the start, really to think about where would a public agency invest? If you look at microtransit as an investment and you don't yet know kind of what the return is going to look like. And one of the things that we considered was, could we actually improve access to opportunity as a public policy goal? And so the theory at hand, which I hope we're proving out, we'll find out, but I hope we're proving out, is the notion that if we could focus on use cases, could we allow folks to be able to move up in terms of their access to jobs? And so in the case of Watts and Willowbrook, uh, one of the things we really focused in on uh, for our very first zone that it launched in December of 2020 was schools. And so actually I was so excited, uh, of course, the pandemic changed the entire world, but <laughs> pre-pandemic, uh, Watts Willowbrook had 42 schools that were open. And from a standpoint of LA County, Watts is one of the areas that is challenged in terms of resources and respect to our 15 LA City Council districts and Willowbrook similarly so uh, in terms of being unincorporated county. So by going into Watts and Willowbrook and making that investment first, we sort of already knew from the outset that this was something that probably only the public sector would take on. And so the concept at hand was really to focus there. And if we focus on these trips at these 42 schools with all these kids, and suddenly we could take care of those fixed route school trippers, right? We could suddenly take care of those after school programs. Perhaps the parents and caregivers would have access to different jobs and access to more opportunity. And I have been really totally thrilled to see how much growth there has been in that specific zone. And it actually ended up being a merged zone because we brought in the FTA pilot within the larger Metro Micro program, which now has, as I mentioned, over 165 square miles of service. And so that area alone has at points been our highest performing area with, within all of our Metro Micro pilots. So I think that's something that's very exciting. And I think it is a very specific space in which it makes sense for the public sector to invest. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Jennifer, the same question for you. Um, how, is, uh, how is Sandag including um, a focus on equity and, and um, serving low-income neighborhoods in your yes. plan? Oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's a, it's a really important consideration for Sandag. And in fact, this last year, Sandag adopted an equity um, statement on behalf of the entire region. And basically it says that, you know, our focus will be on providing projects in areas that have been notoriously um, not invested in enough. And so one of our key considerations in the flexible fleet strategic plan was equity as a top tier um, component of the plan. The focus on our uh, micromobility is really to try to focus on shared rides and rides to transit. So first mile, last mile access in this first uh, go around. That being said, one of the prime pilot areas that we've identified is Southeast San Diego, including Barrio Logan. And this area has a very, you know, it has um, low income and it has a lot of infrastructure challenges in terms of freeways that block access, major roadways, connectors, the Coronado Bridge. And so we're looking at providing not only a pilot that does first and last mile services, but then also provides that point to point connection for people that aren't maybe going to transit or have a shorter trip. So our focus is, is going to be on both in that community. Additionally, though, you know, I would say one of the key components that Sandig already does to help seniors is that we have a senior disabled fare that is um, that costs 75% less than our standard fare in the region for transit. And so we're looking at a fare structure very much in line with that for micro transit. We do believe we'll have to charge a fare. So we would keep that fare at a level that is affordable. And um, our goal would be to also integrate it into our overall transit system. So you would have one card that pays for everything. What we found is that integration is super important. So that's, that's my thoughts on this, Steve. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. And Sanjeev, do you have thoughts on how microtransit can address inequities? 
thanks thanks to you um so uh i think this the san diego 350 project um is sort of uh has sort of two legs two pieces one is to uh for us to uh make make the public familiar with microtransit so we want to work with the coalition partners in environmental justice communities and to, to educate and document the need at the grassroots level and then the second uh, part of our project is is about doing the research to uh, you know to share with transit agencies and with sandag so we can get microtransit funded i think the the latter uh, i want to elaborate on um, if i have some time uh, basically we you know over the last in towards the publication of this white paper we've done um, significant amounts of research and um, you know rani uh, described some of the data that they are collecting i would be absolutely wonderful to be able to compile some of that uh, to kind of um, supplement our research. So one of the things that we recently came across um, uh, was uh, something called the Transportation Security Index that's been developed by the University of Michigan uh, Poverty Solutions Research uh, Group. And they've developed this survey uh, to understand what, what, what it means to have transportation insecurity. And so it can mean things like a missed or skipped appointments or long waiting times or arriving late to work or arriving having to arrive too early to work or even losing employment. Uh, losing out on social uh, relationships and fractured relationships with friends and families and you know fractured relationships with neighbors because you're dependent on them for for rides and so on and so forth so it's a pretty comprehensive index that they've uh, the peer-reviewed published research so we learned about this and uh, most recent data suggests that um, you know half the population that lives below uh, the federal poverty line experiences transportation insecurity, and a quarter of them experience high levels of transportation insecurity. So that's just demonstrates uh, the, the need that exists. And you know this is now peer-reviewed research, so it's not just anecdotal or I feel that you know people are unable to get to work and so on and so forth. So research is starting to happen. So then the other part of the uh, uh, things that we covered in the white paper are the fact that, you know, the, there's no new technology that's needed. I mean, I was looking at all kinds of other new uh, micro, other new modes of mobility where new technologies are needed, like autonomous driving and whatnot. But microtransit exists, you know, algorithms exist, they're being deployed, battery electric shuttle fleets exist. Um, you know, we talked about Frank and, uh, and 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 Fred and downtown, and there are you know there, there's been uh, electric shuttles running in Oceanside and uh, lots of towns in uh, circuit runs all these uh, in lots of towns in uh, in the Greater Los Angeles area. So so the technology exists, and then um, we studied. Uh, uh, during my Sandag um, period, I also studied a lot of academic literature showing that actually when microtransit is scaled up, uh, the level of service metrics like waiting times and you know detours go down. So scaling up actually helps microtransit and that attracts more riders. It's like a nice virtuous uh, cycle. You get you get more riders, you get more pooling efficiency, you reduce the number of single occupancy vehicle trips, you reduce VMT, and you reduce congestion. So it's like this nice, uh, you know, scaling up actually has a great benefit for, for microscience. So we found that. Then we starting starting to see published data from pilots, uh, including, I assume, soon from uh, LA Metro Micro. So there's, you know, millions of trips uh, per year are now being, uh, you know, carried on micro transit so and then um, <clears throat> uh, moving on basically i think point is that i think there's solid ways to document that there is need there is, the technology exists and there's service models that uh, exist for example the la metro micro uh, model but, and as well as the um, as, as some places, some something interesting is going on where you know uh, agencies are combining dial a ride and paratransit and uh, with microtransit, so that overall you get uh, pooling efficiency and you get better service and lower cost per ride compared to some of these uh, some of these uh, very expensive uh, services that have existed for years. So um, and then uh, so if you basically uh, what what we're saying as uh, as uh, San Diego 350 is that 
you know, if we have the will, then there's no need to wait. We can start serving this need now at scale. And um, so, because, you know, microtransit can serve these communities um, on, on existing roads. We don't have to deploy, um, you know, new uh, infrastructure. There's, there's need to do some infrastructure investment uh, because in these communities, um, in low, in low income neighborhoods, we have a history of underinvestment in basic amenities like, you know, side, good repair, sidewalks in good repair and crosswalks with, and, you know, lighting and so on and so forth. So if we can address that, you know, microtransit can really solve the access problem in these communities. So, but, you know, we, we, we do a disservice when we, when we say, oh, we need to wait and see. Um, I think we need to act on this now. Steve. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, you know, I just realized that Jill's background looks like Petco Park. <laughs> yes, let's celebrate. <laughs> we're, well, we're very lucky that the Padres are not playing tonight or else <laughs> that would have been a problem with our attendance. Anyway. Um, Rani may have something to say about that. Yes, yes. Well, question number two, though, coming back to microtransit. Um, what do you consider the greatest achievements and challenges that your microtransit projects have faced. That is, you know, what's worked well and what hasn't worked well, and what has been learned from the work that you've done so far. And this time I'll begin with Rani. Okay, Steve, you're putting me on the spot. Well, I'm glad this is only like meeting nine of the day, so we're good. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, you know, uh, what I've really focused in on is that for us, and it doesn't need to be the same everywhere, to be clear, but for us, I think, you know, we went into it and uh, we really thought that the technology to Sanjeev's earlier point was the area of focus. You know, can we understand the technology? Can we be competitive? Are we gonna set the right business rules on the software? Do we understand the API and whatever other acronyms? And we just were really deep into technology what we, I think, have found in time, and maybe COVID has helped highlight it for us, is that the focus has been on the people. Uh, you know, for us, what we really focus on and what I was really excited earlier in one of those uh, meetings was to highlight one of our operators, uh, actually our very first operator who just uh, completed his first two years with Metro. And it was the focus on the kind of the emphasis on uh, community and the idea that the service that he provides is part of our community, that he's not just an operator or a badge number, but that he is the customer also, as well as the driver. And I think for us, that focus on interactions, I think in a time where we need more community than we've ever needed it, where we need to feel less isolated to Jill's earlier point, I think the promise of microtransit is a very personalized experience and a fantastic one at that. Thank you, Rani. Jennifer, uh, tell us about what has been learned, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what you're thinking about in terms of um, what what is what will work better in the future based on past experience. Yeah. Well, I would love to say that I have a lot of experience. Our Sandic has a lot of experience, but we don't. We don't. We have a few projects here and there. You know, I will say just globally after doing so many studies and really engaging in our strategic plan and working with our, you know, our subcommittee and task force that probably the biggest issue we have is, is first funding. I mean, there's only a set amount of funding that we get in this region. And so to take money away from something else to, to start implementing something new it's a tough thing to do and to take money away from existing transit to microtransit is even a tougher thing to do, quite honestly. So I think that that's probably the first issue that we have. And then secondly, I think that we don't have really good examples in San Diego to point to, to say, hey, this is how microtransit could be a huge benefit to our region. I mean, I'm hearing from Ronnie and I'm thinking, wow, if, I would love to do that. So I just think that, and broad scale, Jill, not to not to dismiss your your crazy good project, but I just don't think that we have something of the scale that we would need to really show that microtransit is a valid form of transportation, and that 
you know, the, the fear is, is that it's going to cost a lot more than traditional transit and you're going to serve a lot fewer people. And probably even a bigger concern than that is that you start to serve one person at a time and you're really doing nothing for VMT or GHG. So um, really trying to develop a microtransit system that gets to the heart of what our goals are in this region, and that's to reduce GHG and VMT primarily, and then also to provide more options for folks. So I would say Sandig's got a few things, but you know we're, we're ready to get started on a pilot, a, a significant pilot, so that we have something to point to. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate your point you're bringing up, uh, those challenges. And the, the next and maybe the last question is going to be about obstacles and how to overcome them. But I'd like to turn to Jill now to tell us about um, achievements and lessons and problems and what has been learned. Thank you. So I think the number one lesson for us, because it was a senior serving um, uh, service, and even though most of the seniors who are taking it are, you know, they're still able to get around and do their own shopping and they're living independently. So I think we had the assumption that they would be using the app a lot more than they do. Uh, and, and so it, it is more phone intense than we anticipated. And also um, uh, many of the seniors have been asking drivers, well, can you wait for me for five minutes while I go shop? And, and to Ronnie's point, it is very personal and these become friends. You know, and there, you know, you, you'll see a bag of oranges that on the front seat of the car that someone gave the, the driver. Um, I, I would, I would, I would challenge Jennifer at Sandag um, with something, and that is, um, what 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 troubles me, and I'm only a four year government person now. I've been I'm in my last uh, last month and a half of public service here. Um, but what, what's astonishing as a taxpayer is seeing all the silos of money and all the different ways that organizations um, do their own thing without um, cooperation. And uh, and I visited uh, our, you know, because I'm about to become a private citizen again. So I visited our school district superintendent, both, both we have two school districts in, in Chula Vista, a high school district and elementary school district, told them all about the service. And, um, and both of them said, you know, uh, with this new bell schedule that starts at 8.30 for the entire state and, and also the mandate to go um, electrified fleet, we just don't have the land to build char bus charging stations, number one. And number two, we don't have the, the flexibility of doing a staggered bell schedule. And so we would like your help in doing micro mobility. And so this is something where, Jennifer, I, I would challenge Sandeg, maybe instead of you know, insisting that Sandeg has to pay for the whole enchilada. Instead, you give um, co agency cooperation grants and say, here's a million dollars for Chula Vista, but you have to find a matching million dollars from Sweetwater and the elementary school district and maybe the, the hospital system that's already doing, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, transportation. And maybe you give us, you know, challenge grants for interagency cooperation so that we can meet several needs because those school buses will sit vacant, you know, and, and, and this, this, and I, I will say this about busing because I saw a question in the chat. We are having a very hard time. I'm on the board of MTS. It's difficult hiring bus drivers. It's just difficult. It's a class C, um, I mean, it's a commercial driver's license. It's, you know, it's not the most pleasant job in the world. There's a lot of responsibility. School bus drivers have a split shift, so it's even harder than that. Uh, the, the circuit ambassadors, we had people lined up, ready to work and not taking other jobs for months while they waited for us to start the service because they love that job. They love the idea of picking up a neighbor, like Ronnie said, you know, being part of, of, of that community and making people happy by bringing them point to point in their community and seeing a familiar face. So I would love to see, you know, uh, for all of us that are kind of in this space now, um, uh, for us to challenge one another to cooperate more and, um, and think about our downtimes and think about how we could share and bend and be flexible, help each other apply for grants. If there's a CMO grant, you know, we only have a shot at a million dollars, you know, whisper, you know, to your counterpart, you should apply for this grant as well. And then maybe, you know, we glue those together with some of the players on the bench. I, I just think this is the way to go. 
um, it just, it makes perfect sense to me with what the state is doing with um, reducing parking spaces for development. It makes perfect sense from a climate perspective um, to have you know, smaller vehicles to charge one zero emission bus. Do you know how much a zero emission bus bus? You know, they just dumped it's $1.3 million to buy a zero emission bus. That's a lot of money. We can run our whole program um, for a year on that. And, well, and, let's, and see, let's see if Jennifer wants, let's see if Jennifer wants to give a quick response. I, and I and I mean a quick response because yeah. no, I, I I think you're spot on. I think that um partnerships are the way to go. I I think that you know that there'll be more of that. Part of the, our pilot efforts is to partner with um, developers as well as different types of agency. One of the reasons we chose um, Southeast is because there's a major, major new senior facility and low-income housing facility there. And the developer has built it with very little parking. And so there, there's a lot of incentive there to really maximize transit use. But it's also difficult, even though Barry Logan isn't horribly served by fixed route transit, it could be better. So, you know, I, I we're thinking along the same lines. I would challenge you back though, that it's very hard to take money away from existing programs. I don't I, Okay, but, ladies, anyway. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump in on this one. Okay. Yeah. Because this is this is a good one. Uh so as I mentioned, when we started Metro Micro, I was in the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, a think tank of sorts. For the last three years, I've been in operations. Uh, for the past two years, I have reported to our chief operations officer. Uh, so what that means is that my budget comes out of operations dollars, all of it. And that is a little bit of heartache, to, to be frank with you. Um, and I think that we have to be honest with ourselves and understanding and being willing, as the chat kind of identified, that cost benefit analysis. Now, I'm most certainly not a member of the board, so I don't know where they'll land, but we have to beg those questions. What is it that transit agencies are meant to deliver? What are those KPIs? Is on-time performance really where it's at in 2022? Is that alone going to define where we are and where we go? These questions about safety, these questions about security, these questions about comfort, these questions about reliability or real-time data, all of those items matter. They matter because frankly, the private sector has set a very high bar and we need to meet that. And I think that each of these pilots helps push us further and that's a good thing, but it's not about putting fixed route and microtransit you know, in competition. It's understanding that there's an ecosystem here. And for certain types of trips, a microtransit vehicle makes a whole lot of sense. But in other scenarios, you know, an Arctic, that's the way to go. we get on that rail. So I think that's part of it is understanding that it's an ecosystem where these modes are not at odds. At least that's my sense. I just want to add one more thing too, because I think this is an important point is that, you know, we don't need to just partner locally with, with our agencies. What we need is at the federal and state level, we need some change in how they categorize funding opportunities. Because right now there's significant pots for capital um, dollars. And it's almost, you know, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's much, 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 much easier to get a capital grant than it is to get an operating grant. In fact, I don't know a very many capital um, grant, or I'm sorry, excuse me, operating grants out there. So when we start talking about what the cost of a bus is at $1.3 million, there's a whole host of EV grants out there right now to buy those buses. What there's not though is money to operate those buses. So it, it's almost like we need to change the dialogue, not only locally, but also at the state and federal level to open up the doors for operating funding and realize that, you know, as we start getting into micro mobility, because I agree, I think this is something that's not going away, that's going to be huge across the nation. Um, it's going to be about operating. It's not really going to be about capital. So I just wanted to add that. Thank so you, I, Sanjeev, I'm going to give you a chance, yeah. moment, but I want to, yeah, so after your response, no worries, yeah. after your response, we're going to go to the questions because we apparently people are really engaged, asking many good provocative questions. That's so perfect. 
That's perfect. I, I, yeah, I, and then we'll do that. No, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I think uh, all these points that uh, were made are, are, are perfect. I think that is the reason. In fact, the reason um, I find that we're doing pilots is because we find ways to get pilots funded and we don't have a way of sustained funding for, for microtransit. So we keep doing pilots. And I think pilots, are, I mean, I think we've piloted enough. Um, you know, uh, Jennifer was saying that, you know, we don't have good um, scaled uh, microtransit uh, deployments to point to in our region, but why do we have to point, point to microtransit you know, in our region, we should be pointing to LA Metro Micro. At, at, that's at scale. Jersey City is at scale. You know, Austin, Sacramento. I mean, there's there's um, there's a lot of places where we where there's micro transit at scale. There's lots of lessons to learn. There's published again back to research. There's published uh, papers on what what makes a productive micro transit zone. You know, what what should be included, what should be the size, and so on and so forth. So there's there's research available to kind of guide us. We don't have to do pilots to learn these uh, lessons. I think there's there's uh, there's plenty of pilots that have been done and we should focus on finding this uh, m way of getting uh, sustained funding for microtransit. And, um, you know, and the, to one, one more point and Steve, I'll let it go. So one more point is that, um, you know, we, we keep trying to compare uh, this cost per boarding or you know cost per boarding hour and so on and so forth but but microtransit and you know regional sort of trolley and express bus they're really serving two different purposes and i was sort of thinking about how best to sort of think about this and i you know came to this conclusion that one way to describe this is to is to talk about mail delivery right and so there's a truck that brings you know tens of thousands of pieces of mail to a post office. And then you have these, uh, you know, uh, mail carriers uh, going around delivering mail routes and one can't substitute for the other. So you can't say that, oh, let's just have the truck uh, do all the mail because the cost per, you know, carrying one letter is, is uh, minuscule compared to, you know, having hiring a dozen mail carriers. I think that to me that was kind of uh, you know eye opening to say yeah we you know there's two there's a, there's the last mile problem and there's the there's the you know and so I don't think we should compare cost per boarding of the two uh, modes it's completely misleading to think that way I'll stop there okay thank you Sanjeev and thank you all the panelists for really excellent answers and I think it's raised a lot of good uh, good points and some very difficult issues as well. I'm going to turn it over to Craig Jones, who's going to be asking questions. Some of the questions may be directed to a particular panelist. Some of them may be directed to the whole panel, in which case you can take turns answering. And I want to say one thing about Craig Jones that I really appreciate. He understands SB 743 and transportation study guide more than anybody else that I've ever met. So he's incredibly valuable to San Diego 350 for that reason. So go ahead, Craig, start going. You know, you, you've uh, uh, called me up too much, uh, Steve. I don't know <laughs> nearly as much as our panelists know. Uh, we've had a great deal of, of activity in the chat. We do have one raised hand. I'll try to get to everybody. Uh, hopefully we won't run out of time here. We have a number of questions from Steve Yaff or Yaffe. I hope I'm not um, stepping on that uh, name. Uh, he's from San Jose, and I expect that he is a uh, transportation or a planning professional himself. Uh, I'm going to do these in order of putting in the chat. We'll see how far we can get. Uh, Steve's first question is, what is the productivity of the Chula Vista pilot in terms of boardings per vehicle service hour? Are the vehicles wheelchair accessible? And Jill Galvez saw this, and she gave a, at least a partial answer already, that they have one ADA van in Chula Vista and five sedans boardings or per service hour. She doesn't have that data, but the drivers, which is circuit ambassadors, have reported they, they are busy nonstop most of the shifts. It doesn't take very long to get across the service area, maybe a six to seven minute total time per passenger. Boardings for the ADA vehicle includes wheelchair assistance. Testimonials have been very, very positive. Uh, Jill, in a, a two second answer, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. That covered okay. it. Yeah, but they're busy. Thank you. 
Very good. And we'll, you know, hopefully uh, what we've recorded here also is the chat uh, and we can uh, do some follow up to in case we run out of time. Um, there have been a couple of calls for a post to the link to the our call to action. This will be provided before we close out tonight. Uh, and a link to the white paper, I think, has been provided in the chat as well. And I'm sure that uh, Peter will provide that again. Um, another question from Steve. What is the productivity of Metro Micro in terms of boarding, boardings per vehicle service hour? Is there an answer to that? Yeah, definitely. So we've kind of been hovering around the four number. It's not where I would like it to be. Uh, you know, I like to shoot for the stars. So I really think from a microtransit standpoint, frankly, from just sheer KPIs, you know, five should be your baseline. Uh, I think seven, you're pretty good. 10, you're probably the best in the industry. So we'll still, go, still keep going after that. Okay. If we have time, there's some more comment on this actually uh, in a minute towards the end of the comments. Um, from Sean Shrum, Santa Cruz, uh, he has a comment. Uh, Santa Cruz, in Santa Cruz, a recent increase in funding for Paracruz and Metro was redirected to roads. Uh, is there any comment on that? I know there's been discussion here uh, and a lot of buzz about how to pay for flexible fleets in general, microtransit particularly, and the, um, the fight, if you will, between conventional transportation, even private automobile systems, and public transportation. But any comments on uh, what uh, uh, Steve said about Santa Cruz recently changing funding from Paracruz and Metro redirected to roads? Yeah, but I'm gonna and jump in here. So uh, of the many meetings earlier today, I gave a presentation to the ad hoc committee on streets and highways, and we talked about roads. <laughs> Arguably, we need to drive on roads. So it is a reasonable investment to make sure that they are safe. And uh, in all seriousness, you know, again, I think we have to think about this as an ecosystem. And if we take that outlook, we understand some things are going to cost more microtransit. Some things are going to cost less fixed route bus. But what are we trying to achieve when we know that humans are basically multimodal? And if we can really get that trip type right to that vehicle and right size it, then I think we're doing pretty well. And it, frankly, it just doesn't need to be at odds with the car. Thank you, Jennifer. Did you have anything to add? I kind of saw you. No, I, I would. I would agree that you know if we could get an ecosystem, just as Ronnie was saying, it goes to help everybody. It's not just about trans. I mean, at Sandag. You guys know that it's almost a constant war between roadways and, and transit. And it, it gets better and then it gets really much worse. And so um, I, I think there has to be a collective change in thought in San Diego about how we approach our mobility. And you know what I would like to say too is that one of the major factors in providing microtransit and getting good numbers, good productivity numbers, largely is around land use, because if you don't have densities then that support you know, a lot of people want to get from place to place, then your numbers aren't ever really gonna get to where you would want them to be. And low density areas are use case because it's difficult for people to get around, but they're also not super cheap to serve. So it's just something that we have to think about. And that's why I go back to the use cases we need to figure out what works best for each community and each type and have a whole system of different types of services. I'd, I'd like to jump in there, uh, Jennifer. I think you're right. And I think uh, I think there's, as I, as I was saying earlier, I think there's uh, a lot of research uh, indicating how to choose zones, which are kind of the right density where you get uh, you know, sufficient ridership and you know it's compact enough that you're not spending you know, half an hour getting from one place to the other, but, you know, so I think there's ways to choose these. Um, and, I, and, I, and there's one other sort of topic uh, that comes from there. And that is that when once you choose these zones and you choose them well, and they're, you know, there's, they, they, 
that micro transit service <clears throat> micro transit service in those zones becomes a kind of a magnet for attracting more density because now you have an opportunity to uh, you know it's it's transit uh, available in that zone and i've been sort of um, um, talking about this uh, as a as a concept i've been calling it micro transit oriented development and uh, I really want to dig deeper into this, uh, you know, do some more research into the idea that uh, land use can kind of follow micro transit. And, uh, you know, if anybody listening uh, wants to research this with me, I'm, you know, it's a shout out to please uh, email me. Thanks. I'm going to add my own quick uh, opinion piece onto this too. Regionally, it should be obvious that the more we sprawl out, the more it costs to maintain roadways for every trip taken because the trips get longer. We have more roadway to maintain. So the cost for maintaining roadways is much greater with sprawl development. And this impacts, uh, impacts both uh, the cost for private automobile use and the subsidy for that, but also for public transportation using the public roadways. Uh, next uh, question from Diane Nygaard. She asked if we can talk about factors to consider and how to optimize GHG greenhouse gas reductions, and I assume this is applying to uh, flexible fleets and microtransit, how to optimize GHG reductions. Anybody who wants to jump in? I, I think that the three mile surface area um, it really optimizes it for us. And uh, if, if I could stretch back, just a quick touch back to the other point. Um, if, if you ever lived in an area like Washington, D.C., where the metro, you know, is kind of the lifeblood of getting around uh, that that area, you're, you're charged based on where you're going, how far the trip is. So 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 if you're going on a long trip, you pay a longer fare. And I don't think it should be any different. Um, ultimately, when we do get to maybe a statewide system of one ubiquitous form of payment, one ubiquitous card or app, or something that serves everything that you're taking from the micro transit to the fixed rail to the bus to maybe a, another rail or whatever, in the last mile, whatever your whole transportation journey is, um, at some point you're gonna, we're gonna have as a state, a seamless payment method that kind of covers your whole trip. And, um, and maybe the different options are um, you know, some legs are more expensive based on, you know, time factors. And if it's more customized, like microtransit or, you know, more, um, more shared, like a, a fixed rail or, or a bus. But, but I do think that, um, but that, that can be built in that, that, I mean, it, we're, we're ultimately going to get to that place. And right now in all of our little pilots that I think, you know, I, I'm ready to go, you're ready to go, Sanji, but but I do think that pilots do serve a purpose because it helps you get it right. It, get, it helps you get it right in a certain area and, um, and helps you, you know, kind of know, know your community and, and right size it and then expand and not, not make mistakes because we don't have enough money to make mistakes. Uh, but, but, um, but back to the, the, the GHG question, um, I would say, you know, from just an anecdotal um, standpoint, if I have to drive across town to pick up my mom and take her to the grocery store and then drive back and then go back and get her, and, you know, I mean, I'm using um, a, a carbon-based, I have an electric vehicle, but <laughs> most people have a carbon-based um, uh, vehicle right now. And um, if, if mom's able to do that independently, at least for our service, it's a hundred percent electric. And, and what I, also love about it so much is that our vehicles are charging at city hall where um they're charging at night uh, where then there are no employees there and then during the day when the employees need to use those chargers the vehicles are out serving the community so i love everything about the way our service is working i can't say that enough and um and i hope it continues to expand so jill i gotta i gotta start bringing my evs down to your city hall it sounds like i'm i'm very interested uh, that is so cool. <laughs> but uh, but seriously, I mean, I think the EV piece, just going back to GHGs, is huge. And I think we're honestly in really early days, even in California. 
in respect to, you know, sort of EVs and EV integration for smaller vehicles. And I think that's a huge area of growth. And it's a perfect example of how transit properties, DOTs really need to coordinate and collaborate and starting to move the industry at a far faster pace uh, towards that end. So again, uh, go ahead, yes, Jennifer. Call on Jennifer yeah. Yeah. I was just gonna say that, and this might not be a popular thought, but I think what we really need to be careful about is not recreating Uber and Lyft with microtransit because Uber and Lyft, you know, there's been a lot of studies that they increase VMT. They're just, they're, they're very guilty of that and they increase GHG. So as we implement microtransit, we have to be sensitive that we're not just creating a point to point one person trip because really that's not much better than the automobile. So I think we need to look at how we can do a lot of shared rides. And I thought Jill brought up a good point about driving to pick up your mom and going and going where you need to go. But what we're finding is that a lot of the 20 year olds, you know, that that group, the late teens, 20 year olds, they will pay to drive alone. They will pay to have that Uber trip alone. So I think that where we need to head is, is to kind of make shared mobility a much more acceptable option for people. That's, and I, yeah. you know, I think we're working on that, but we're not there yet. That's such an important point, Jill. You're absolutely right. I think, you know, we, that, that statistic was like 40% uh, increase uh, in, uh, in BMT with Uber and Lyft compared to, you know, single per personal driving and so on. That, that number is kind of worn out over, over the years. And so it's all about pooling. The good news is that I know of at least half a dozen, uh, you know, private companies who've been who've kind of uh, been finessing these uh, algorithms for uh, for pooling, uh, pooling and uh, and 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 shared rides and uh, and maximizing uh, occupancy and so on. So, I think. Uh, the the work towards ensuring that is there the second part of it should be uh, of us uh, as, you know as sandag and so on uh, of figuring out how to incentivize that shared right so you know uh, basically um, you know uh, incentives for pooling uh, penalty for you know deadhead uh, zero occupancy uh, travel to pick up uh, someone and so you know that that is how you ensure that you know pooling is increased I'm going to jump in here because uh, Ronnie has told us she's given us her five minute warning to take care of kiddos. We can all identify with that. Uh, let's see if we can get just from her a response to the next question here. Uh, also from Diane Nygaard uh, to talk about, uh, first of all, considerations about vehicle size and then whether to charge a fare. And I think vehicle size uh, also addresses the, the Uber Lyft uh, dichotomy. Thank you, Craig. Great points. And thank you, Diane. Uh, first, I'm going to take the question on the fare. So we do charge a fare, albeit a nominal one. Uh, all Metro micro trips are a dollar. So it is a revenue service operation at a dollar. Uh, we had a very exhaustive uh, series of discussions with a fare working group over maybe eight months uh, pre-COVID in respect to what the fare would be. Uh, that all got thrown out the window uh, when we found ourselves in a pandemic. And we really thought about accessibility for everyone. And frankly, we, and I've said it to the board, we kind of lost focus on use cases because ultimately if you're launching the week of the COVID surge in LA County, you just want anyone to get into a shared vehicle. <laughs> so really we thought about essential trips and focused on essential trips. We've probably gone through a half dozen surges similar to LA, uh, similar to San Diego and LA County. So that has really been the focus. And so we're just sort of beginning to course correct to focus on that. Uh, while we continue the pilot, which has about 13 more months, I don't anticipate us increasing that fare in part because it'll really, really kind of um, challenge our data. And so that's really the piece in mind for us right now is skewing the data set itself. So I anticipate there will be a probably an increase of sorts that the board will direct upon completion of uh, this initial phase. Um, and then the second question, Craig, can you remind me real quick? It has been a, I start my day around four, so you gotta, you gotta help me out here. Second part of that question. Uh, whether to charge, I think you, you, you've you addressed it, whether to charge a fare, but also um, talk about vehicle size and how that relates wow. to the service. Okay, so I'll leave you guys with this. I am so excited to find the vehicle of the future. 
And I don't think it's any of the vehicles that we have in our fleet. Uh, apologies to all the OEMs out there. I don't like any of them. So I really think there's a lot of space between where we are and where we need to be. And I think the industry has an amazing opportunity to test these cars. So we have about six different uh, that we're testing, but I hope to learn so much more from what you're doing with flexible fleets, from what you're doing in Chula Vista and across the country. So I would just say, I think that we really have to go a lot further with this. And frankly, we should kind of come together as an industry, similar to the way that we do in bus and rail to really understand what the spread is and also appropriately so to push the industry to get those EVs, but also to get fleets that make sense. I mean, even in respect to the ADA question earlier, there shouldn't be ADA vehicles and non-ADA vehicles over here. We really do need a united platform and I, I hope that's where we'll get. So I'm gonna run you guys, uh, yep. but thank you so much. Uh, come to LA, uh, glad, to, glad to host you at LA Metro. Take care. Thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, orange on here. Uh, I, I wanna note that uh, our, related to earlier chat activity, Jennifer put into the chat uh, a link to Sandag's Flexible Fleet Strategic Plan. You can find that in the chat. And Jennifer, if you have a chance, you can put that in there again, just in case uh, people um, missed it the first time. A question from Mark Narcus Kramer. Uh, several transit authorities are opposed to microtransit flexible fleets because they're afraid that money will be taken away from them. How can we counter this view since in many cases it will increase ridership by traditional transit? Uh, also, he says some routes are inefficient. I assume that means uh, traditional transportation. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna to try to address that? Yeah, I think he's, he's right. And I think that our MTS and NCTD recognize this. And in fact, when MTS was going out for a ballot measure, um, SD Elevate a couple of years ago, they did include microtransit programs because we do have really low ridership in places like Rancho Bernardo and Poway. And, you know, there's, there's pockets of this county that are very, very suburban and very difficult to serve with traditional transit. And so, you know, I think that there is an acknowledgement of the transit agencies that this needs to be another arm of the transit agency. And there's a willingness. And I will say, NCTD, which is, you know, a whole different service area up there. They have, a, you know, very different development patterns and they are much more engaged in microtransit. And in fact, I've heard their CEO say that he really sees that microtransit could be the primary mode up there in addition to buses and the rail system. So, you know, just because they're so, um, it, it's a very difficult development pattern out there. There's canyons, there's cul-de-sacs, there's long distances, there's, it's just very, very difficult to serve with traditional transit. So I, I don't think there's fear. I think the problem is money. And, and I've seen in the chat, you know, people are saying it's not taking away money. It's, it's, we need more money. We, it's just, we just need a lot more money in this region. And Transnet is, is running out as our local um, sales tax. So we don't have a lot of that to put towards projects. What we need is, is a comprehensive um, source of operating revenue that we can then you know, shift to microtransit. So we can have the transit, we can get rid of the traditional fixed route where it doesn't work and replace it with microtransit, but we still need to operate. Transit works in San Diego. I mean, if you look at, look at Petco Park, they never would have been able to do that Padres game if they didn't have the trolley running. Or look at the Route 7 along University Avenue, or look at, you know, um, any of the, the major service corridors going to UCSD with Midcoast has been a huge success already. So Again, it's an integrated system. It's about finding more money. It's about, you know, I believe there will have to be some rationalization of where operating funds go, but I don't think we should ever do that at the expense of our existing services, unless it doesn't make sense. So I'm just here to advocate for more money. I, I think I just, <laughs> Jennifer, I just want to call you on one thing though. I think there's a, there's a danger uh, of, uh, you know, exceeding to, uh, microtransit for 
places where it's actually not suitable. I think all research, as I was citing, was pointing to places which are dense as opposed to, you know, uh, that's how you get kind of boardings per hour that get to six and 10 and so on and so forth, right? And so when we say, oh, you know, let's do it in Poway or, or some rural part of Vista or something like that, um, I think that's a guarantee of non-productive microtransit because, you know, you'll if if it takes half hour to get somewhere to a sprinter or something like that it's not going to be and that will be a pilot that will you know show that we've kind of uh, misused funds and so i think that's why it's very uh, you know it, it can't be just uh, not using the knowledge base that has you know built or built up over time yeah that's why we have use cases and that's why our first project will be in a very dense urban area because we we agree with you but there has to be something for those groups. You can't just ignore um, suburban communities and and you know leave those residents to their their own fate, if you will. They there is kind of a, a general sense that you do need to have some some level of mobility for everybody in this region. So again, use cases, and it might not just be that you're providing that thirty minute trip. Again, you can develop a finite service area. And maybe in Poway, it's like the rec center and the senior centers and the very similar to what Jill is talking about in, in Chula Vista. You wouldn't open it up to all of, you know, a North County area or, or the entire study area. So I think, you know, it's being very conscious about what types of service and how you, you develop it. So. Very good. I'm going I, to. Can I, add, can I add to that question real quick? So very quickly. Um, Okay, so the MTS board is supportive of microtransit and they are studying the Chula Vista Community Shuttle. But I would say that um, in terms of, uh, you know, the ability for maybe MTS to, you know, uh, di not digest, but take over a service like this and actually be part of the, the management of this in, in whatever fashion um, and roll it into maybe Pronto, the new Pronto card. Um, it is an added expense to add fare collection onto microtransit. You need some sort of transmitter per, per um, vehicle. You either need some sort of ability to collect money or give change if you're allowing, you know, for dollar rides and things of that nature. So, so you know, it's not, you know, terribly easy to go from the free service, which is what we have, to a paid service, unless um, you're able to maybe roll into an MTS and say, if you have a pronto fare, it's free to go to the fixed rail and 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 do it that way. But uh, thank you for allowing me to that's say that. Just, that's one, Jill, that's one of the other uh, elements of the five big moves, but let's not go there right now. David, I'm gonna call on you. You've been very patient with a raised hand. Uh, do you have a quick question or comment? I have a quick comment, which I'll couch as a question to uh, Jennifer. Um, the Kehoe bill, uh, some years ago, which uh, enlarged Sandag's taxing authority, explicitly allowed Sandag to tax for the purpose of paying for transit operations and maintenance. And this is directed to your comment that it's hard to get state and federal grants for operations and maintenance, and it is. And there are, are a variety of reasons why that's the case. But Sandag certainly, when they are looking at ballot measures, should be looking at taking advantage of that gift that Chris Keogh gave you, is you can raise money for that operations and maintenance cost. Thanks. Steve, I'm going to bring you to the board meeting. You can pitch it. <laughs> or I'm sorry, David, David, I'm sorry. Yes. Very good. I uh, want to apologize to everybody. We are running out of time. We have uh, several other questions that have been put into the chat. Um, I'm assuming uh, Steve and Peter, that we can find a way to um, have our panelists perhaps uh, give quick responses in writing and we can provide those back by email in some way. But uh, very reluctantly, I've got to uh, pass it back to Steve at this point. Great dialogue, great discussion. Thank you, Craig. Whoops, I, I, I actually did unmute myself for a change. I thought I hadn't. But thank you, Craig, and thank you, the panelists, and thank you, all the participants, for your great questions and your thoughtful comments. I am now going to turn it over to Peter, who has some wrap up 
things for us and some next steps. So Peter, take it away. Yes, thank you, Steve, and to all of our panelists so much for a great and engaging uh, discussion tonight. Is everyone seeing the slideshow with the panelists' contact information? No? OK, great. So um, our panelists have, have very graciously agreed to share their emails. If anyone would like to follow up with them, please feel free to be in touch. They are all busy people, but I'm sure they'll get back to you. Um, and then the final thing that I want to say before we wrap up in just a few minutes here is that, of course, at San Diego 350, we aren't just about educating and informing. We are about empowering people to take action. So what we are asking you all to do um, is to read the executive summary of San Diego 350's microtransit white paper that Sanjeev and the transportation team worked very hard on over the last several months. Um, and we will share that with you. Uh, Augusta has shared the link in the chat, but look for a follow-up email tomorrow or early next week and you'll get all this. Uh, so read the summary, it's six pages, and uh, the full paper is about 30 pages if you wanna get into the details. And then we're gonna provide contact information for your city councilors, your county supervisors, and, and the board members of MTS, NCTD, and SANDAG. And we're asking that you email them and share the white paper executive summary with them and tell them one reason, uh, perhaps based on what you've learned here tonight, of why you are excited about this idea and want them to fund and implement a microtransit service in your area. And with that, that concludes our climate chat. So I would like to ask everyone to give a virtual round of applause to, um, to Steve and Craig and all of our panelists and uh, look out for some upcoming events coming up from San Diego 350 uh, on Monday. Uh, there will be a press conference and vigil for climate justice uh, organized by um, the ICEJ, which is a, a coalition partner of San Diego 350. And then on uh, Saturday, December 3rd, we are having a, uh, an Alice in Wonderland themed tea party in Balboa Park, a little membership appreciation fun. Uh, so go to San Diego 350.org slash events for these and other upcoming events. And with that, uh, we will thank you for attending and wish you a great evening. Thanks, everybody.